Hi everyone, welcome to Historically Speaking, an online YouTube history channel focused on the history of various institutions and professionals, how history intersects with education, culture, and the world around us. I'm Karen Yang, host of Historically Speaking. Today with us is Professor Ron Silliman, who has written and edited 40 books of poetry, critical theory, and memoir. Among his awards, he's received the Levinson Prize from the Poetry Foundation, a Pew Fellowship, grants from the California and Pennsylvania Arts Councils, and two literary, literary fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. He is a 2012 Kelly Writers House Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania and currently teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's also uh, created this widely popular blog called the Cinnamon's Blog, um, a web blog he started in 2002 and has had over 4 million visits, which is super, super crazy. Um, Professor, thank you so much for coming to Historically Speaking today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to your bio um, or to your introduction, I guess? No, that's that's quite fun. Awesome. Without further ado, we're just going to jump straight into it. Um, I've really just enjoyed consuming a lot of poetry recently with my AP Lit class. Um, and I guess that with all your expertise and experience, why do you feel that, you know, poetry and studying poetry is so important in history and also in this present moment, I guess? Well, um, I have a bias toward poetry. It's the only art form um, in which you can do anything you want with language. Um, the, it's not that there are no rules, but that you get to choose which rules you want to adhere to, which you want to do something else with, and, and follow it uh, from those terms. Um, it has been at the leading edge of literary innovation in the English language since the 13th century, when uh, Chaucer, a member of parliament in London, where in those days the, the bougie educated crowd spoke not English, but French, decided to write a poem in English called the Canterbury Tales, and at the, at the same time and very far away, particularly in those days in the northwest of England, a poet whose name we don't even know, so we refer to him as the Gawain poet, uh, decided to uh, write a long poem called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, also in English, but in a very different English from Chaucer. Um, and both of them were betting on the future of this uh, language, which was not the language of industrial elites in that part of Europe in that century, French was. Uh, it turns out they made a good bet and, um, you know, here we are nearly 700 years later, uh, still reading their works. Um, and it has gone through a wide range of changes. Uh, it changed when it came to the U.S. between 1619 and 1840. There were good American poets writing in English, but they tend to be one-offs like Phyllis Wheatley or Anne Bradstreet or a man by the name of David Drake, which I encourage readers to look him up on uh, Wikipedia. David Drake was a slave uh, and was a person for whom reading was forbidden, but he happened to work initially for a printer uh, and therefore reading was encouraged so he could carry out the tasks that his owner wanted to have. And then he moved to a large plantation, was sold literally, uh, I think the printer died, um, to a large plantation which had a division of labor. And his job then became making ceramic pots that people could store water, milk, and that kind of stuff in, or plates that they could eat off of. And that's what he did pretty much the rest of his life. But right around the base of his pots, 
he inscribed very simple poems so that 250 years later, people know the name of David Drake and they know the name of his poems. So for, for him, simply managing to make himself known over the centuries was an enormous accomplishment, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I consider him one of the uh, three great poets of that period. Mm. Who else belongs in that category of like great poets during that period, in your opinion? There are relatively few others that I would put up in exactly that framework. Around the 1840s, there finally were enough poets practicing in America to have two kinds of poetry, one of which thought that Americans were smart enough to do just as well as the British poets, and they wanted to follow them pretty literally and show that they were good romantic poets like Wordsworth and Keats, but better, that they could do it. The truth was they weren't really better. They sort of come across as, as good imitators. They were known literally as the New York Knickerbockers, name of a basketball team today. And they found a group of opponents uh, up in the Boston area who called themselves the Young Americans. Uh, and they argued that America was a completely new and different uh, country and we needed to find our own voice and it would be very different from the British. None of them particularly are known today, although you can see in what they're talking about that they're really predicting the future of Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, and the like. The one <laughs> poet from that period who really was a great poet, Edgar Allan Poe, was always in favor of whichever group was buying the drinks. Uh, and uh, so, he, I mean, he tended to make more fun of the uh, um, Knickerbockers than he did the Young Americans. But uh, by and large, uh, he was playing both sides of the street. But then later in the 19th century, there is Whitman, there is Dickinson. And then in the 20th century, uh, starting with one student who'd gone to Johns Hopkins and three students from Philadelphia, two fellows who met in a class at the University of Pennsylvania, a Puerto Rican uh, poet from Patterson, New Jersey, by the name of William Carlos Williams, and his redheaded friend who grew up in the very same suburb that later uh, B.B. Netanyahu would grow up in uh, by the name of Ezra Pound. They met in a chemistry class. Uh, like a lot of college students, they sometimes got to uh, accompany the professor to his house and um, talk with him. Their per science professor was a man named Charles Doolittle. He had a daughter, Hilda, uh, who later became a very famous poet as well. She was Usher Pound's fiance for a while. Uh, and they all went to Europe. Uh, right around uh, 1910. William stayed there for a week. Um, Hilda Doolittle and Ezra Pound really never returned. Um, but modernism really came out of that exchange. I tell my students at Penn that when they walk down Locust Walk, they're literally walking exactly where modernism was founded. Um, and, and you can trace almost all of American poetry from that point going forward to those three and that one person from Johns Hopkins by the name of Gertrude Stein. So. Wow, that's so cool. Like that like physical act of walking there also kind of recalls like the first beginnings of modernism. I think that's super, super cool. Um, I wanted to direct a question more to your own personal like history or experience with poetry. Okay. Yeah, so um, what's been your history or experience with poetry? Well, I, and, I, I, mm -hmm. I knew I was going to be a writer when I was 10 years old. I had an experience in which a buddy of mine, uh, who's still around, although these days 
he was a heroin counselor rather than a writer, um, uh, wrote a satire in our fifth grade class talking about other students in the class and their reaction to him, who was always in trouble and never picked to do anything, sitting at the front of the class talking about them. Uh, and I sort of heard the, the meta levels going on there and had an aha experience. And that got me writing more seriously, but I literally didn't know what I was doing or how to do it or anything. I grew up in a house mostly without books. So, you know, that wasn't a great help, but there was a public library and my family was always anxious to get us out of the house. Um, and uh, so going to the public library was always approved of. Uh, and I tried writing. I wrote the worst teenage boy novels ever written um, and um, was starting to look around at poetry and not connecting with it until one day at that library, I, I went and picked up a book simply because of the color of its cover. Uh, which stood out as being very different from the other books of poetry. And it was the, the Desert Music and Other Poems by William Carlos Williams, who was by that point one of the grand old men of American literature, uh, the first Puerto Rican named Poet Laureate, for example, um, but um, and a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, although they they waited so long to give him that award, he had died before he could accept it. Um, but he was he was still alive and in his 80s at the time I picked up that book. And even though it's the most narrative poetry he ever wrote, what I saw was exactly the opposite. All the ways in which he was deviating from normal narrative and showing that you could do anything you wanted on a page. That for me was another aha experience. And so I started telling people I was going to be a poet. I was just about your age when, the, when this happened. Uh, and it took me about two years to really start trying to write in earnest uh, poetry in the US and just because I was A, lucky, uh, particularly because I lived on the edge of Berkeley where there already was a literary community, and because I really didn't know any better, I started writing at, you know, two years later, maybe at the age of 18. And by the time I was 19, I was already publishing in lots of places. Um, that was much easier then than it is now. When I was starting to publish poetry, there were maybe 2,000 publishing poets in the United States. Although there's no document from that period that puts the number at above 100. Uh, but that's just an erroneous assumption. If you go back and read Poetry Magazine for that entire decade and just count how many people appeared in Poetry Magazine, well, it was 700. So a number of 100 was obviously off. Um, and they were not publishing anything more than a, a fraction of the American poets. So 2000 is a reasonable estimate. Today, when you're roughly my age, there are 50,000 publishing mm -hmm. poets in the United States of America. That makes it both much easier to get published and much harder to get noticed. Mm -hmm. um, so the poets of the 21st century are going to have a very different experience going forward than the poets of the 20th century had, let alone the poets of the uh, 19th century in, in uh, English, where, you know, you could talk about a couple of hundred poets and be real. Uh, or in French, Charles Baudelaire, man who invented the prose poem, 
moved to Paris uh, and waited three years while he could collect as many books as he wanted uh, or as he could afford before he allowed anybody over to look at his, his apartment. And um, when he had them over after three years in Paris, he had the largest private library not in a castle in France. It had 24 books. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've i recently culled my collection down from about 12,000 to 6,000. Mm -hmm. And I probably have 4,000 ebooks in PDF files and Kindle Mobi files and things like that uh, tucked around as well because I'm a constant reader. Um, and, you know, so the world is very, very different and different going forward. You know, the poetry you write and the world in which you inhabit is going to be a very different universe than the one in which Whitman inhabited, mm -hmm. uh, let alone people like Anne Bradstreet or uh, David Drake. Mm -hmm. What do you think has been like a catalyst of that change in the world? Has it been like largely social media, you think, or like just like technology? As a result of well, it's it's been technology in more than a couple of ways. Mm -hmm. The typewriter was invented in the 1820s, and as a business product, it was an abject failure. Nobody wanted it. Everybody was handwriting or printing letters. Um, during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln could not read the reports from the field because too few of the soldiers actually knew how to write legibly. And so mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln went out and bought typewriters and sent them to the field. And the result of that process was that in the latter half of the 19th century, typewriters became somewhat common. But Ezra Pound, former Penn student, um, Philadelphia boy, uh, was the first poet to start composing on the typewriter. Uh, I think Mark Twain is usually considered to have been the first prose writer, fiction writer, to have done so. Uh, and it was just getting started. When I was your age, writing poetry, um, I was writing in notebooks, which I pretty much have done up until the last couple of years uh, when my handwriting deteriorated from old age. Um, but I, I, I would also type on the typewriter, which meant after dinner, going to the dining room, picking up my grandfather's typewriter, a large, very heavy luggable manual typewriter, carrying it to the kitchen table and writing what looked a little like the, the liner notes to a, an early Bob Dylan album um, for an hour or two uh, every night. Um, I get When I got my first National Endowment of the Arts grant in 1979, I went out and bought an electric typewriter, an IBM Selectric, for about $800. And I thought, that's that. I'll never need new technology again. <laughs> um, and then by 1982, I had learned how to use a computer. And I was even teaching others how to use computers and was computerizing a magazine that I edited in those days called The Socialist Review and um, using it to mass produce fundraising letters and things of that sort. A far cry, uh, but I still wasn't doing original compositions on it. I was just typing up manuscripts. And that pretty much continued. And I ended up uh, working for about 22 years in the technology industry. Uh, and then after I retired, um, I finally went and uh, Penn had been asking me to come and teach a class uh, ever since I moved east. And I kept saying I don't have time, which was absolutely true. I had one of those um, 
day jobs as a market consultant, which is actually a 70 hour a week gig. Um, and so if I had time to write poetry, it was it was pretty amazing. If I had time to write poetry and do my blog, it was really amazing. But I finally retired in 2011. And uh, by 2013, I was starting to teach at Penn. And then since the 2015, I've been there every year. Um, and even won an award for teaching, which is not bad for a kid whose terminal degree is still only a high school diploma. Uh, because when I was going to college, uh, I got drafted and ended up uh, performing alternative service as a conscientious objector, which is what led me to go to work in the nonprofit field, which I did for 25 years. So 25 years in nonprofits, 25 years uh, in the computer industry, some teaching jobs along the way, even when I was in my early 30s, I was being asked to come and teach poetry. Um, but it didn't become what I did did until I was in my 60s. That's mm -hmm. a very long answer to a short question. Well, that was great. That was super interesting because um, I'm kind of, you know, kind of on the threshold of considering what I want to do as well. And I think it's really cool that, you know, you have something you really love and enjoy doing, but you can always have a part of that and, you know, have another job or something else like that, which I think is something I want to do as well. <laughs> when, I, when I went to college, I used to joke, I studied poetry. One of the things I did that I was definitely helpful is speaking of Ezra Pound, I went back and read uh, when I was a student at Berkeley, all of his correspondence, which was on microfiche in those days, um, you know, it was like microfilm in which you whirled around the projector and, and read it blown up. Um, and um, I read every bit of it. And so, I, I mean, I did things like that weren't, wasn't part of any class, um, but it was definitely an important part of my education. When I first started college at San Francisco State in 66, I registered so late because um, I was a pretty disorganized kid. I took a three-year gap year and only decided to go to SF State because I'd heard they'd had a creative writing program, of which there were only about six in the country when I started taking it. Um, but I registered so late I could only get one class. Uh, so I spent the rest of my time on campus going through the, the poetry section in the library, 811.08 for American Poetry. And what I didn't know at the time was that up until that fall, uh, the poetry buyer for San Francisco State was a man by the name of Robin Blazer, who was himself a major poet uh, of a generation, basically of my parents' generation. And he had just moved to Canada. Um, so they didn't replace him with somebody who knew nearly as much as he did. Uh, I was fortunate to have gotten that to that collection right at the moment it was at its very best before they started deaccessioning uh, books that people didn't know about and weren't reading, you know, which happens to all libraries everywhere. And sometimes like library book sales are a great place to find books. I bought Gertrude Stein's Stances and Meditation um, for 25 cents at a library book sale because nobody had checked it out the previous five years. Um, but uh, they, there was a period there in the first 10, 20 years after her death in 46 when she was pretty much unknown. And then the poets of the 50s and 60s started 
you know, advocating for her work. And then she became more well-known and then more people began reading her work and saying, wow, uh, what is this woman doing? How come we don't know her? Um, and uh, so today she's standard part of the curriculum, but uh, in the 1950s, there were four American poets who were talking about Gertrude Stein um, Robert Duncan, um, Jerome Rothenberg, Richard Costellanitz, and Lou Welch. And all of those poets are somewhat known today, um, although none of them are as famous as uh, Gertrude Stein. Um, but, and, and Lou Welch is largely known today as having been the stepfather of the rock and roll singer Huey Lewis, uh, of Huey Lewis in the news. But, um, you know, those were the people who kept her work alive during a 15 year period where she could easily have disappeared forever. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate. I mean, we're fortunate she didn't have the same fate, say, David Drake had. Um, or even uh, even Emily Dickinson. I mean, Emily Dickinson sent her poems to one of the poets who would have been the, one of the sons of the Knickerbockers. And he did get her poetry into print, but he also managed to tame it a lot by taking out all of the dashes and dots and, and sort of weird breaks that really make her work one of the most compelling and interesting of the 19th century and turned her into a much tamer poet whose work can almost entirely be read to the tune of the Yellow Rose of Texas. And that's not who Emily Dickinson was. Um, but just because she was originally published under those terms, it took people almost a century to figure that out. Of course, mm -hmm. she didn't want it published at all. I mean, her instructions to her sister was to burn everything. Mm -hmm. um, as our time wraps up, um, is there anything else you'd like to add or any, I don't know. I, I'll, yeah. I'll give you one bit of advice, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of how I got started with poetry. And I think it still works pretty much today, which is to simply connect up with any poet you connect to, whether it's William Carlos Williams or Rupi Cower or, you know, Nathaniel Mackey or uh, Natasha Trethewey, you know, and, and, and find out who they're reading and go back and expand and find the poets that they're reading who you connect to and find out who they're reading and, and, Keep doing those concentric circles. Um, you know, I don't think it's necessary anymore to go back all the way to Chaucer or even to William Blake um, to have a good sense of what contemporary poetry is. Uh, and at the same time, I note that every single year, my students come in with some new rap star who they are really enthused about as a contemporary poet. And what I've really noticed over time is that it's never the same guy twice. Um, and that it's always a guy um, is, is, the, is the other part. Um, so, I, you know, don't worry about who that first poet is. Uh, just keep expanding your reading uh, and reading all around. And eventually you'll have created a books, uh, a community of books that mean a lot to you uh, and writing that you can build on and you can build up from there. And you are about to discover going to college that you will just find a tribe there who agree with you about some of this stuff. And if they don't, there are plenty of people online who will. And, um, you know, the idea of four or actually five million readers of a blog talking about poetry is not an impossible thing. Yeah, I aspire one day. That's so cool. Yeah.
Well, I wish you the best of that. Yeah, thank you so much as well. Um, and to everyone at home, thank you so much for watching. Um, and I'll see you next time.